Um, Cal, it's James. If you are talking, your mic is muted, just so you know. Hi, everyone. I think we're just waiting for Cl Clarissa to join us. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I was joining, but I did not hear any audio, so I had to rejoin. Just to say, if anyone's having issues with the audio, if you refresh the page um, and then select the join Zoom via pop-out option, that, that's what fixed it for me. Okay. Right. So, um, okay. So just bear with us a second. I feel more familiar now in Zoom, so that's great. So thanks, everyone, for joining us to this 12-ish uh, minute breakout room discussion. We are really keen on... Um, Cal, can you um, share, can you make me a co-host or something just for my slides? Let me just stop doing the screen share. Super, thank you so much. Okay, so you should all be seeing um, my screen now. It's just really a very brief um, kind of uh, one minute introduction into what we're going to do now. So you've heard my talk earlier about our COVID and care homes research. And in this group discussion, we really want to find out kind of your thoughts and ideas about where we can take long-term care research, institutional long-term care research within the ARC um, as next steps. So um, we are currently doing some COVID-19 care homes work. It's very topical um, and obviously there's a huge impact on people's lives. But what we really want to find out in this discussion now, and we'll have a whiteboard and we hope you all contribute with your thoughts, is really to understand what are your experiences? Have you been affected by it? Do you have any research ideas? Um, have you been involved in long-term care research? Um, and really some ideas for focusing on follow-on research, so also post-COVID, considering now we've got the vaccines uh, starting up and running in the near future. So this is just a very brief introduction as to what we would like to talk with you about. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And Cal, could we have the uh, whiteboard up, please? Super, thank you. So if you want to explain to people how this works with the uh, Jamboard, please. Sure, so if everybody just clicks the link, which is inside the conference platform that will launch this Jamboard and you will be able to make changes to this yourself. It's really user-friendly. Um, or if you prefer, you can let us know what you would like us to add in the chat and we can do it that way. Could you maybe also share the link in the chat here on Zoom? Would that be possible? I'm sure I'll just have to stop screen sharing for a moment to, to go and pull okay, that Okay, yes. So, but if anyone in the meantime has any thoughts, please feel free to unmute, unmute yourself. Um, so we've got Rosie in this group as well, and she was giving the talk earlier about the Me2U Care Centre. Um, so, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Clarissa. I could, I'm not sure whether I can get into the breakout rooms. I'm just sitting in the background patiently. Well, you are in our breakout room now, so that's good. OK, I'll get on the video then. Yes, yeah, so if people want to um, start their video, please feel free to do so. Um, so you see Rosie and me now, might be a bit more interactive, I suppose, than just seeing a screen talking. Um, so we've got the Jamboard link in the chat now as well. Lovely, thank you. So yes, are there any ideas? Do you have any experiences of um, care homes during the pandemic or before possibly? Everyone's staying on mute. Everyone's shy. All right. Rosie, do you want to um, share a bit about more what you are doing in terms of long-term care with your centre? Yes, well. How I've filled some gaps in regard. Um, there's been a couple of clients who we have, we've sort of zoomed in with clients crisis intervention where they've been at a point 
something where they've needed a care home. You're breaking up a little, um, Rosie. We've um, our, our game really. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's, it's a bit patchy, but go on. It's a, a bit of a delay. Oh. Is that better? Go ahead, try. <laughs> No, I think Rosie's frozen now. Um, what I was saying was there's been times through COVID where we've had... Can you hear me now? It's not that clear, Rosie. I've just seen a comment on the jam board as well, though. Um, so someone's, someone's highlighted communication about care is really challenging, particularly when the patient cannot communicate for themselves or lack of capacity. Yes, definitely. So we've had um, we've heard a lot of those issues with residents with dementia, but also there's a lot of sensory issues. So most of the older population in care homes, for example, is deaf. And then when people are at the moment, care home staff is wearing the face masks and family carers on their visit, visits, that creates an additional barrier. Is there anything else that people feel might be um, interesting look to look at maybe both in the light of COVID or afterwards. Um, you can just add this directly as Cal is doing nicely there, giving you some guidance, which means you also don't have to speak up. You can just post a comment on there. Can you hear me now, Clarissa? Yes. Okay. So I, I just wanted to add through COVID, um, lots of the care homes wasn't taking admissions. Um, and our day centre had to sort of up its game and, and we became sort of crisis intervention um, where because there was periods where we stayed open despite restrictions. Um, we'd done capacity assessments and we weighed up risk versus benefit and we just brought clients who were high risk to our centre, sometimes on a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one um, to support families whilst um, they were in crisis and care homes weren't taking admissions. I think yeah. we've all sort of adapt and react and be flexible and open-minded and, you know, realise that our clients don't fit in, in the boxes that, you know, they, they, they want them to. We, you know, they're, they're individuals and it's got to be person-centred. Yeah, definitely. Um, so... And I think that's what's sometimes missing in care homes, but also in daycare centres, that individual tailoring to care, um, at least from our um, information. So that someone else posted something, information flow from between organisations, so hospitals, care homes, etc., is sometimes poor. Yeah, and also between the family carers and residents at times, uh, we've found that quite difficult in terms of communicating, particularly at the moment because care home staff is so occupied um, with providing that additional COVID care. But also what Carrie, I think, can also um, confirm that having done so many interviews is that care home staff seems to take on new roles because residents can't see their families anymore. Um, have you found that, Rosie, as well, maybe, that people are taking on additional roles? Well, I mean, going back to the care home, it's now limited. And we had an open door policy. So we allowed families, you know, carers to come in, have a cup of tea, some lunch. And now obviously, you know, the stopped at the door. You know, it, it's just, you know, especially with people living with dementia, they just can't. It's hard for families to hand over their loved one when it's, a, you know, the first day I, and you can't welcome them in, show them round you know, let them feel the spirit in the day centre or in the care home. It, it's just it's just really sad, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is. Um, Carrie, I know you wanted to chip in here. Yeah, I think that's a really important comment, actually, about the, the residents and the family members. They really wanted that care home experience to feel like a home from home. And I think a lot of the adaptations that have been made like Rosie was saying it was all about risk management so they've they've 
tried to eradicate the risk of COVID, but from doing that, they've perhaps remove that home from home element so it doesn't have that feel that makes people feel comfortable and, and confident you know having a, a loved one staying there at that time yeah definitely I'm mindful we've only got one more minute very quickly um so we've only have two comments but if anyone um has any other thoughts or I mean you can always email us afterwards as well if you have any thoughts coming up um yeah, it's really just to encourage um, you to hear from you what you think should be maybe done within HCAL theme, but also wider within the ARC in uh, care homes research. Um, okay. So, okay, so, well, this helps us for our next discussion, Kerry and Rosie. So we've got a few comments. So I'm not sure whether, does this stop automatically, Cal, um, this breakout room? I've been told that we may have to rejoin using Google, <laughs> but okay. I'm hoping we can just stay and keep our Jamboard on the screen. Okay. Hi everyone, hope the rotation went well. Cal, the um, second group are going to start joining now. Thank you, James. Okay, okay so do we have, um, I suppose we have the second group of people joining us now, is that right? Yeah, it'll be a, a minute or so, some, some will still be leaving, some will be joining, but they're on the Okay, way. well, we'll wait a minute then, thank you. Shall I stop screen sharing so we can go back to your introductory presentation, Clarissa? Yes, please. Right. Carl, can you let me know when you want me to start because I can't really see anything else now. I can only see my uh, slides. I think we can start now. We have 24 yeah. participants. Okay, lovely. So, um, hello everyone. Second round of breakout room discussions. Um, so we've got about 12 minutes um, to have a bit of a chat and to uh, hear from you what uh, might be good ideas for research and care homes and long-term care. So you've heard earlier from me um, in a little video about our COVID-19 care homes research that we've currently, um, well, we've wrapped up data collection for. Um, it's very topical, obviously care homes are in the news. But, oh, I can hear myself twice. Um, but what we really want to use this, um, this breakout room for is to hear from you. So you've heard a bit about what we've been doing so far in long-term care research, particularly COVID related. What are your experiences? Do you have any direct experiences? Uh, do you have any research ideas? Have you done research in that area? Um, and it, yeah, and also if you have any ideas post COVID, could everyone mute themselves please, by the way? Thank you. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing now and then we put up a jam board, which we've already populated a little bit before. Um, so if Cal could put that up again, please. Super, thank you. So, um, Cal, could you also copy the link, please, in the chat box again here on Zoom so everyone can see that? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll just stop this for one moment. Oh, sorry. Yes. So what we'd like you to do now, if you feel a bit shy and don't want to raise your voice, um, which you can also do, um, but if you just want to pop down some ideas on this Jamboard, and Cal is just sharing the link in the chat box now. Um, so if you go on that, have an idea, have a thought about care home research within the ARC, within the HCAL theme, um, just put it down there. So previously from the uh, first breakout room session, uh, people were saying communication about care is really challenging, particularly when the patient cannot communicate for themselves or lack of capacity, obviously particularly with uh, people with cognitive impairments and dementia. 
Someone was also saying information flow between organizations such as hospitals, CAMs, et cetera, is sometimes poor. And what we've noticed as well, that communication between family carers and, and the actual care home is really poor. And someone else just posted mental health of care home workers, all staff, including housekeeping, domestic and kitchen. Yes, that's a really important issue we've just started looking at. Um, and we've also interviewed some um, housekeepers as part of our research. It's a really good point. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts? You can either unmute yourself or just put it on the jam board. Um, Clarissa. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, I think that's a, a valid point about looking after staff because we talk about person centred care and I think that starts with the person delivering it. Mm -hmm. So if the person delivering the person centred care is well, um, you know, their mindset is, is in a good place, then that sort of filters down not only to the person who they're trying to care for, but that rubs off on the families, the carers, and that person-centred care then becomes holistic. So we must really start person-centred care with the person trying to implement, you know, the you know the the, the person-centred care. Definitely. Um, okay. So we've also had someone else just put down vaccination decision making, how are informed decisions made? Yes, I think we've, was it just this morning in the news that care home staff isn't actually, the care home residents aren't the first ones who are getting the vaccine. Um, so it's all about the doses that are available and who gets it first. Um, impact of the COVID vaccine changes of practice, yes. And I mean, COVID isn't, going away quickly so that there will be also long-term implications of COVID on the care home sector, even though staff and residents will be vaccinated. Um, there might be long-term changes in how care is being delivered, for example. Okay, so keep on populating this board. This is really good, really interesting. Um, Kerry, any thoughts about the mental health of care home workers from our interviews, maybe to kind of illustrate that point a bit more, how staff was feeling? Yeah, um, so the, the staff interviews were quite interesting because some of them talked about um, the kind of mental impact and, and how it made them feel about their job. So they they were feared uh, fearful going into work that they would actually catch the virus themselves and bring it home to their families, which was something we weren't really expecting to see in the interviews talking about the the care home and the care home residents. But they they had to live with that fear as well, um, as then spreading it to other residents, um, you know, or any family that can come in. So I think there was definitely the impact from that respect and then this extra burden that they had to take on so they talked about the loss of activities that were happening in the care home and all of a sudden they had all of this time that they had to fill um, and uh, their roles did change quite a lot trying to take on activity coordinator roles or um, just trying to be the the, the emotional um, person that the resident could go to as well as doing all of their practical care so it seemed like there was a lot of um, increased burden and um, the impact on their mental health as well. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, role changes within the care home staff job, I suppose. Yeah. I think future research, it would be quite nice to see how people recover from this as well, how, how um, services recover from it and what kind of um, uh, changes they've made in order to support the um, the residents as well as the care home staff, anything that they've, they've been able to do to make it easier for them. Yeah, long-term implications, long-term benefits, hopefully, yeah. to this sector. Um, yes. Um, anyone else wants to join in? So we've got lots of people in this group. Everyone's shy, no one's joining, brilliant. So if you feel too shy, just put something maybe on the board. Um, otherwise, you'll just hear Kerry, Rosie and me having a chat about care homes, which might be um, not as engaging. 
Okay, so we've talked about the mental health uh, of care home workers. Carrie, Rosie, might there be anything specifically for the residents as well? That might be important to look at. Um, I think, I know we've got one particular end of life care research on this uh, in this group right now, um, mm -hmm. but we've also looked at the end of life care, didn't we, Carrie, in the yeah. interviews? Yeah, that was something that came through, uh, again, more prominently than we thought we were going. It wasn't really intended in the topic guide to capture it, but I suppose when we're looking at visitation abilities, usually the only time that a family member could then go and visit their relative was for this end of life um, process. So it did actually come through quite a lot. And then it was whether or not the care homes were able to offer any kind of um, kind of leeway with it. So could they hold a hand at the end of life or could they remove any of the PPE? Um, and again, that varied quite a lot between care homes um, and it was quite inconsistent. So I think there's, there's definitely something in that to look at. Could that be standardized and, um, and what kind of impact does that have on the family members as well? Um, can I just add to that? Yes, yeah, sure, Rosie. Um, so I can sort of speak first hand about that because um, obviously my dad, you know, Clarissa uh, contracted COVID and he was he was in hospital and he, and he did actually pass away. But depending on who was on shift on that day um, and, you know, everything varied as to how many of, of us could go in to what PPE we had to wear, we could stay, to whether we could play music for him. So... I'm not sure if it's just my internet, but I think you might be breaking up Rosie. Um, so I think you've, yeah, you're on okay. mute now. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a couple more comments here because I know that there's a changeover now as well. So we've had one comment in the chat box. Cal, could we maybe post that as a comment on the Jamboard as well from Jamie Hunter. Um, so could you research on the fact that the elderly in care homes during COVID are not provided with adequate care and instead um, are getting the DNR signs placed on them? I think it's a disgrace. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a topic as well. Um, definitely. There's another... Um, that's actually a few now. Great. Um, so impact on residents uh, who were not allowed to mix, which kind of links in with the other comment, impact on the relationships between residents. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so from our work so far, it's very different between care homes. Sometimes they have specific wards where the wards keep on mingling, but between different wards, they're not allowed to mix anymore. Um, whereas, yeah, others mostly stay in their room because they are afraid. Um, yeah, I'm mindful it's the end of this breakout room session now. So thanks for joining. Thanks for posting those comments and do enjoy your next breakout room. <laughs>
So you've heard my um, talk, well, brief talk earlier on our COVID-19 care homes research and the data that we've collected and are currently analyzing. What we want to use this rather short breakout room discussion for is to hear from you about what are your experiences? Do you have any direct experiences of care homes, both during COVID or pre-COVID? Um, are you a researcher or do you have any specific ideas what should be looked at in terms of institutional long-term care, care homes, nursing homes, both maybe during now this phase of COVID, but also post-COVID? So that's my brief introduction done. And now Cal is going to share a Jamboard on the screen and you should all see the link to this in the chat. Cal has just kindly posted the link to it. So if you go on the link, you can then post your thoughts on research and care homes there. You can also unmute yourself and share it with us, but I'm just going to run through some of the thoughts that people have added previously. There was a big discussion surrounding the mental health of care home workers, um, I suppose this goes beyond care homes as well in terms of paid home care staff. Um, that should be looked at, including housekeeping, kitchen, gardens, everyone really, and the huge impact of COVID on staff. Um, there's something about information flow that was raised between organisations such as hospitals, care homes, but also between family members and care homes, which seems to be incredibly poor, particularly now during COVID. Um, what else has been raised? Uh, someone mentioned, oh yes, uh, so another focus was on the impact on residents and their, um, them being able to socialize and mix. So there have been different experiences so far from what we we could find that sometimes people were allowed to mix, sometimes they weren't, but it's still not fully clear how that truly impacts on the lives of residents. We can more or less assume and we have some indications from care home staff and from family members who maybe have seen them twice in the last nine months. So what we really want to use this now is looking at this and from your own background, do you have any additional thoughts that we could look at on care homes research? Or do you have a comment on these that were already made, for example? I wonder if just looking at all of these comments um, that we've had already, it'd be quite nice to think about the lessons learned from the pandemic and how care homes could prepare again in the future if something like this was to happen. So what, what kind of things made it easier for, for them um, or what kind of things would a care home need to put in place to be able to be prepared for a similar kind of pandemic in the future? Yes, definitely. Um, I think there's also some long term implications there generally what yeah. um, care home experiences and provision should be like in a non pandemic setting. I mean, mm -hmm. it was shocking before. It's now been kind of put under the um, um, spotlight a bit more. Yeah. But yes, some long term thinking. Yeah. Anything else from anyone? I know we've got a mix of people here in this um, breakout room now, different experiences, different backgrounds. Anything you'd agree with or disagree with maybe that's on the jump board? I think what is coming from me is about the evidence-based practice because before the COVID quite often, the, for some of the nursing stuff which I look at, struggle to have time to look for the recent evidence and I think to shape the practice and I think during the COVID was a possibility they actually have even more responsibilities and duties so how do we find the time to look into recent practice thinking how it applies to them especially during the COVID all these policies and new evidence appearing on the everyday basis so I think that's coming to the previous point made how we can learn from this pandemic for any future uh, fast changing environments? Yes, um, I'm not, um, do you want to briefly introduce yourself as well? Maybe just for us all to understand your background. 
Uh, sorry, yes, I'm a, one of the new PhD students looking at the public and patient involvement uh, for the last two years. I actually work in the nursing and midwifery department. So there's a lot of work with the community nurses in Scotland, especially okay. around space practice. Great, thank you. Okay, um, yes, definitely. Um, any other thoughts from people? So I suppose we've got now a few. So lessons learned from this pandemic, information flow between organisations and, uh, well, families, uh, mental health of staff and the impact on residents in terms of socialising and emotional impact. I mean, I think, uh, Clarissa, thinking about what you've just been saying about information flows and also... Um, person speaking previously is that um i guess the pressure on staff to be able to um assimilate and get on board with the various guidance that has come through and the impact of that constant sort of change and trying to make sure that they are following guidance and, and meeting and being able to implement what what they're supposed to be implementing that there's a there's a real pressure on staff to to try and do that within their you know, daily practice to be constantly keeping up to date. And that's certainly something I've heard from the work we're doing is that that's a huge amount of work and pressure to, to try and keep up to date with where things are up to. Definitely, that's something that came out in our interviews as well. Into Well, um, many care home staff have said, for example, their working week went from, well, 40, 50 hours a week to suddenly 70 hours a week. Um, and then having to, you're right, having to keep up with all these constantly changing guidances on how care should be delivered, PPE. And then on top of that, provide communication with family carers. So yes, definitely there's a huge pressure on the staff. Mm -hmm. Right, um, anyone else, any other thoughts? Uh, Cal, could we put Adele's comment in a box, like uh, just looking at um, difficulties with information flow and guidance, keeping up with guidance, something along those lines? Carrie, any, um, any further from the research on that guidance particularly? I think it was it was very interesting what yeah what you're talking about um, and what Adele was saying in terms of trying to keep up with all of these new roles that they have to be um, adding into their normal work routine and ultimately they're not really sure if it's even effective or it's right for the family or right for the residents. So what you know some of them were saying they have to physically navigate the communication, digital communication between the residents and the family members, but the family members were actually feeling that that wasn't, it was quite stressful for the resident, it wasn't actually very helpful for them. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, the same for everybody, but definitely the care home staff need to know um, what kind of guidance they need and is that guidance appropriate for their working schedule or did they just try to do everything at the beginning and now they need to go back and look at what was, what worked well and what didn't work. Yes, yeah, great. Um, I'm not sure when this session is it about to end in a minute or so, Carl. Yes, sir. Will you yes. ask research about the support for the workforce of the care homes, the support during the COVID time for them? What support was available for the workforce and the in care terms homes? of psychological support? Psychological support. Um, not much, not much. We don't know the full extent to it, but not, there was nothing specific provided for them, but we know it's had a huge impact on their mental health. Um, most of our interviews were quite tear provoking as well, and many people were crying. Um, uh, Carrie has had that uh, experience particularly, sadly. Um, 